was a hot January night. My family had scored tickets to the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion's pr production of The Phantom of the Opera. After the performance, we made our way through a large underground parking lot and we went home humming the melody of the theme song. We retreated to our separate rooms at around midnight. I was grateful that I didn't have to set the early alarm for the next morning and I fell asleep to the music of the night in my head. At 4.31 a.m., I was violently shaken out of my bed. I remember the feel of my carpeted bedroom floor under my shaky feet as I frantically made my way to the door jam, screaming, earthquake! But between the noise of the furniture crashing down and the rumble of my next door neighbor's home splitting in two, I could barely hear my own voice. I secured myself in the door frame and consciously wondered, when will the shaking end? When the ground finally steadied, I remember the urgent rush to get out, to check on family, to assess the damage. I remember my mom frantically yelling at me to get my shoes because there was glass all over the foyer. I ran back upstairs in the dark where I discovered that they were inaccessible, stuck, underneath my large, heavy bookshelf. I stood there for a moment in awe of the damage until a 6.0 aftershock struck. I was not going to get my shoes. There's nothing that you can do to prevent an earthquake. You're not in control, but you can prepare. And so in the days, weeks, and months to follow, our family changed the way we did things. We made sure to keep flashlights and shoes and socks by the door at all times. We placed fresh batteries and food supplies in a grab bag nearby. We bolted bookshelves and other, other heavy furniture into the studs of the wall. We made changes then that carry on today. That was 26 years ago. In the aftermath of the 1994 Northridge earthquake, society also made changes that carry on today as well. New building codes were established, our bridges and other public sector structures were assessed, retrofitting of buildings was required. California's Office of Statewide Health Planning and Development was created to ensure safety moving forward. In the aftermath of this jolt to the system, as individuals and collectively, we learned and we changed the way we did things. The 1994 earthquake came unexpectedly just as many events have shaken us to our core this year. Society has been upended by the pandemic. We've mourned the deaths of many loved ones. We have learned of devastating unemployment, suffered economic downturns. We have witnessed grotesque racial injustices. Each of these instances have shaken the foundation of our lives and begged the question, what have we learned and what changes are we now called upon to make? A few months into COVID, we have now adapted and made the short-term adjustments needed to continue with our lives while ensuring we're staying safe. Similar to, similar to earthquake kits, my family now has plastic baggies of masks and hand sanitizer and gloves ready to go by the front door. In the Jewish world, rabbis from all over the country have pivoted to a new way of doing things. We've considered how we can safely create community while still upholding our most cherished values. I recently participated in mentoring with a group called the Center for Rabbinic Innovation, where Rabbi Sid Weissman shared with me that she, was, that she views us innovative rabbis as passionately steering our communal ships through the storm, responsibly caring for every person aboard. We've grabbed a wheel and are adapting to the conditions we see ahead. To avoid public gatherings, we set up Zoom. As we prepared for the high holidays, we took pains to elevate the technology to inspire awe and grandeur. We continue to usher people through the deaths of loved ones by creating meaningful adaptations of rituals. 
like virtual Shiva minions or the recitation of psalms by some around the world in loving memory of the deceased. We have adapted with intention. Society as a whole has also pivoted, but sadly, we're not quite there yet. Not everyone has taken to serious social distancing. Not everyone wears a mask in public. Not everyone has refrained from gatherings. We still must accept the need to adapt. Now, I understand it can be hard to heed the call to action, however obvious. Jonah, whose story is traditionally read today on Yom Kippur, was directed by no less than God to tell the people of Nineveh to stop sinning. But even he resisted the instruction. He didn't want to tell the people that what they were doing was wrong or unjust. He didn't want to be the laughingstock of the town and face near certain rejection. Maybe he felt like resistance would be futile and he wouldn't be able to effectively persuade the people of Nineveh to change their ways. Either way, he didn't want to be the agent of change. So Jonah chose instead to board a boat heading in the opposite direction of Nineveh. And then he hid in the belly of the ship. <clears throat> After a series of miraculous events, including a giant whale swallowing him whole and spitting him out onto dry land, Jonah repented and finally agreed with God's instruction to take action to, to stop the people from sinning. Once he accepted this responsibility, it was easy. He appealed to the king of Nineveh, who then in turn proclaimed, let everyone turn back from his evil ways and from the injustice in which he is guilty. Once Jonah let his heart, led his heart to the change, he was then able to persuade the king and the king directed everyone in his city, a large city of three days walk across to pivot, to turn from their sinning ways. This one story illustrates the power of individual action to affect mass communal change and the major difference it can make when we accept the need to change upon ourselves. This is the type of pivoting we need today. Even though it's difficult to admit, we can now see that the systems that we have set up are grossly unjust. We now understand that the people who barely earn minimum wage, which is not even a living wage, daily risk their lives to keep our economy afloat. We owe it to the grocery workers, postal carriers, teachers, trash collectors, and others to pivot, to embrace the reshaping of society, to value their work so they don't have to hold two or three jobs just to put food on the table. Teshuvah, a moral pivoting toward justice, has begun in terms of racial disparities too. Changes have begun to take place, the likes of which I never would have thought possible in my lifetime. Many of you know that I've been involved with social justice work for over 20 years now, since I first inter interned at the Liberty Hill Foundation in Los Angeles. There I was inspired by the changes I saw happening. The Bus Riders Union who successfully advocated for better service and the first major metropolitan clean bus fleet in the US. Homeboy Industries was giving jobs to formerly incarcerated gang members, which helped them secure a brighter future ahead. But in 2003, I interned in a peace oriented organization in Israel and I saw how hard it was for people to change their grudges, their hatred, their ways. That experience made me expect less in terms of people's ability to change. I assumed society could only make the smallest, most incremental adjustments, always bending toward peace and justice, but in tiny baby steps. But now I see that was such a limited view. I should never have lost hope for more fundamental change in my lifetime. Human beings are capable of so much more. We can pivot. The past six months proves that this is possible. 
For instance, corporations are beginning to raise awareness in human resources and management about the dangers of implicit bias, unfair hiring and firing. In the sector of sports alone, the WNBA, the NBA and NASCAR have begun to recognize that there are problems within their organizations and they're looking to make changes. Even the NFL, which had previously ousted Colin Kaepernick for raising awareness for the problems of racial injustice, even the NFL has begun to pivot. Their commissioner, Roger Goodell, made this statement in June. We, the National Football League, condemn racism and the systemic oppression of Black people. We, the National Football League, admit we were wrong for not listening to NFL players earlier and encourage all to speak out and peacefully protest. We, the National Football League, believe Black lives matter. Change has begun and it is up to us to continue the progress. The changes that Jonah made and the change that the people of Nineveh made proves it's possible. The fact that I still, 26 years later, make sure that there are shoes and socks by the front door because of my earthquake experience proves it's possible to make lasting change. So today on the most holy day of the year, it is up to us to consider what changes we need to make, however drastic, to ensure our and our community's mental, physical, emotional, and spiritual well-being. What do we need to do to make sure we pivot toward creating a world that speaks to our values? Things are not static. Just because it's how we've always done things does not mean that it's how we have to continue to do things. What I'm saying is that powerful change is possible and there is power in the pivot. If we know how to do it and are intentional about bringing about change to Shuva, if we consciously realign our actions with our values, the world will be a better place. Together, we can turn the world. Kenny Hiratsun, may it be so. Mm -hmm.